Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, Multivariable Measurement Simplifies Increasing Complexity. This is co-hosted by ISA and Honeywell. I'm Michaela Cooper with ISA and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to review just a few housekeeping items to let you know how you can participate in today's session. Uh, first, in regards to the question and answer session, we'll have a Q&A at the end of this webinar. And to submit your questions, we'll just have you type them into the Q&A box that's on the right-hand side of your screen. Please do not use the chat box for the Q&A, only the Q&A box. If you have any miscellaneous questions for me, that's when you can use the chat box. Um, you can submit Q&A questions at any time throughout the webinar from the start to the end. Um, if you um, have a question that you want to discuss in more detail with the presenter, their contact information will be given at the end of the webinar, so you can contact them directly. Uh, second, for those of you who just joined, please make sure that you are on mute. If you would like to see the phone and audio broadcast instructions again, please refer to the confirmation email that I sent to you today. Or if you go to the top left-hand left -hand side of your screen, you'll see a tab labeled Event Info, and some of those connection instructions are included there as well. Additionally, once this webinar closes, a survey will pop up in your browser. We ask that you just take a few minutes to fill out the survey. It's really short. We just want to hear your feedback on how this webinar went um, and any comments that you have for us. Okay, and I think that takes care of some of our housekeeping matters, and I'd like to go ahead and get started and introduce our presenters. First, uh, Tom has 25 years of experience in the process industry, with 12 years spent directly supervising the instrumentation, electrical and refrigeration maintenance groups. In the past 20 years, he has provided technical education at San uh, Jacinto College and through the ISA organization. Tom is a senior grade member of ISA, college departmental advisory board member, and a member of the Texas Community College Teachers Association. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Karthik. Uh, he's a global product manager with Honeywell Process Solutions. In his over 16 years with Honeywell, Karthik has been responsible for a variety of products, including the smart line temperature transmitter and the field instrument uh, configuration tools. He is currently responsible for the pressure and multivariable transmitter product lines. He is a member of ISA and is BEE Certified Engineer uh, Energy Auditor. Welcome. Thanks. Last but not least, we have Mark. Uh, Mark is a Senior Principal Systems Engineer for Honeywell Process Solutions with over 30 years experience in the field in analytical instruments and distributed control systems. He was a key contributor to the success of the world's first smart 420 multivariable transmitter. Welcome. Thank you, Michaela. Now I'd, like, now I'd like to pass it off to Tom, and he'll go over the agenda for this webinar and kick off this webinar. Thank you, Michaela. Greetings, everyone. Today's agenda will be to discuss the traditional multivariable measurement single to multivariable measurement, multivariable measurement fundamentals, recent trends in multivariable measurement, what does the multivariable transmitter actually do, the benefits and possible applications, challenges in applying multivariable technology. Then at the latter part of the discussion, we'll have an example of a heat exchanger, and then I'll have a summary, and then we'll have the question and answer period. The traditional volumetric to mass flow measurement was rather uh, clumsy and, and difficult. If you look at the red clouded area, FX112 can be any system that you might have in, in place. But what we had to do is we had to take a pressure transmitter. If we wanted all the information about the flow loop, we had to take a pressure transmitter, a temperature transmitter, a flow transmitter that measured differential pressure, and then send it either to a standalone controller for analog or digital or a programmable logic controller or a distributed control system, like I said, depending on the system that you had. So if you look at the notes under this thing, we had to first come up with the volume flow rate, 
Then we had to do temperature compensation and pressure compensation, and then and then correct the uh, density of the material for those changes in temperature, and finally multiply the volumetric flow rate times the density of the material, and finally we'd come up with mass flow rate. Why do we need better measurement? If you take a look at the two equations I've got here, it's, this is not for the purpose of math class. This is for the purpose of trying to get you a better feel for exactly what's going on in the multivariable transmitter, and it is considerable. The first formula at the top calculates the volumetric flow rate, and the formula down below that will calculate the differential pressure if you square both sides of that equation. So if we go back up to the top equation that is relative to the volumetric flow rate, all of the factors that are involved starting with S, S is a dimensionless number that is arrived at by taking the discharge coefficient, the velocity of approach, and relating that to the beta ratio, which is the ratio of the orifice bore to the inside diameter of the pipe. Then N corrects for the engineering units that we're using. D squared is the inside diameter of the pipe. F sub A is a correction for thermal expansion of the orifice plate. F sub M, as far as I know, is no longer used. At one time, we used the manometers to measure low range differential pressure, but for a number of years now, we've got differential pressure transmitters that can get in the very low ranges areas down to zero to five inches of water column. So as far as I know, no one is using that, that factor anymore, so it drops out of the equation. Then we take the ratio of the square root of the flowing gravity divided by the base gravity times the square root of the differential pressure that we're using for the calculation, and then the last two factors in the equation are for compressibility and viscosity correction. So as you can see, there's a whole lot going on just to arrive at the volume that we're looking for. Here's what we really want to do with the transmitter. We want to take the line pressure and the differential pressure and the process temperature, combine that into one unit, and come up with a multivariable measurement where we can do all of these corrections and calculations in one device. Multivariable measurement fundamentals, theory of multivariable measurement, measuring multiple process variables in one instrument in order to accurately measure volume as well as mass flow through appropriate flow compensation. So listed here again is the, the concepts of static pressure or line pressure, gauge pressure or absolute, most of the transmitters will do that, the, the differential pressure and then the temperature of the flowing fluid. Under flow compensation, we have two types of compensation that we divide it up into, standard compensation and dynamic compensation. And dynamic compensation is where we want to go with the multivariable transmitter. Here, what is standard flow compensation? The process of measuring the differential pressure produced by a primary flow element, the absolute pressure, and the temperature of the flowing media and using these measurements to compensate for variation in density to calculate the mass flow of the fluid. Boil down to a little bit more simplistic display, on the left hand side of the equation for volume, we have the relationship that volume is proportional to some coefficient K, which represents all those factors that I just talked about, times the square root of the differential pressure. Then when we get all that out of the way, we correct, using temperature, we correct for the density of the material, and then we multiply that relationship times the actual density of the material to get the mass flow rate. Under multivariable measurement fundamentals, again, what is dynamic flow compensation? The process of measuring the differential pressure produced by a primary flow element the absolute pressure and the temperature of the flowing media, and using these measurements with other data such as pipe size, bore size, type of flow element, all of the all of the previous considerations that I've made you aware of, to compensate for error-producing variables while calculating flow rate. Multivariable transmitters compensate for the following variables to increase mass flow accuracy. So here it's listed again 
some of the factors that I mentioned previously, the discharge coefficient. Whenever we get to gas expansion factor, we'll look at the new way of looking at this formula. The previous formula that we looked at is the old way of presenting volumetric and doing the mass flow calculation. And now I'll show you when we get a little bit further into the discussion, I'll show you the uh, ANSI standard for, for calculating those variables. The velocity of approach factor, viscosity, density. So we've got a whole lot of stuff going on in these devices that we're going to be talking about. Multivariable measurement fundamentals, since we're not talking about a specific gas, the only thing that the next two slides will hopefully present to you is how the volume and mass flow rates change as a function of pressure and temperature changes. For example, here with the temperature graph, if we refer to 60 degrees Fahrenheit as our base temperature, if we increase by 20 degrees and we look at it, we can have approximately a 4% error with a 20 degree Fahrenheit change in temperature. Conversely, if we go back in the opposite direction and go from 60 degrees to lower the temperature and go to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, again, we get almost a 4% error. Unfortunately, all of these relationships are, are very rarely a linear relationship. For pressure compensation, shown here are several different curves for pressure compensation. As you can see, whenever we start talking about temperature and pressure compensating a gas flow especially, the relationships are all over the map, so to speak. Here is the new way of presenting the the factors that I mentioned previously for dynamic compensation of flow measurement, mass is equal, again, the N represents the uh, engineering unit conversion, depending on whether I'm going to be working in U.S. customary units or international system units. The discharge coefficient is C. The gas expansion factor is Y, and for liquids, it drops out of the equation. The velocity of approach factor, the bore diameter, the absolute pressure and the density for the material. So inside the brackets, we do the calculation of volumetric flow rate, and then we multiply it times the density so that we can get the mass flow rate. And now I'll turn it over to Mark to talk to you about some of the recent trends in multivariable measurement. Thank you, Tom. So if you look at the, the recent trends and you, you look at all of the calculations that, that Tom just was, was showing you, uh, one of the first and foremost things that's happening is you need a lot more microprocessor or calculation bandwidth. And to do that, a lot of the suppliers of integrated circuits have teamed up with the producers of field instruments in the last couple of years to develop custom systems on a chip that actually enable field instrument designers to uh, get better accuracy, more functionality, more processing bandwidth in the part. And we actually use these systems on a chip in specialized ways. We may apply them toward a sensing element for pressure or temperature. We may apply them for a communications protocol, whether that would be um, a heart type of communication or field bus communication. Um, we may employ them for, for graphics uh, capability, for displaying process variables. So what do you do with all of these controllers? Well, we, there's a tendency to distribute the processing to specific tasks, and by having a dedicated system on a chip that's calculating pressure, um, you can get faster flow rate calculations. You can get faster differential pressure calculations. You can actually do calculations that are compensating the sensor values with polynomials that uh, are error correcting uh, devices or mathematics to actually fix the measurement itself. With regard to um, temperature processing, the trend that we're seeing is that by having a dedicated controller or temperature block there, 
it gives the end user a lot of flexibility as to what type of pressure sensor they may want to use on their input. It could be an RTD for high accuracy temperature calculations, which would give you more accurate flow rates or mass flow rates, as well as lower cost thermal solutions and thermal couples. So it gives the end user the ability to select the type of sensor that matches the accuracy needs and, and can also save you a little bit of money in selecting the, the device that it's better, a better fit for your application and, and accuracy needs. With field communications, um, wireless and heart are all, are all possible types of connections, field bus. Again, these are situations where having a dedicated controller um, that's designed specifically for processing a stack is very, very useful. With regard to the human interface, right at the device itself, having a graphic display locally on the device gives you the ability to look at the history of your flow rate. You can look at individual inputs to your flow rate, some of those, the actual values for some of those parameters that you see in the flow equations to, to ensure that things are happening the way that you would expect. Having this extra processing power under the hood also leads to the development and the runtime of advanced diagnostics. These are routines in addition to the calculations that we just discussed that are running in the background. These routines enable the end user to have faster and more reliable detection of any device status or faults that occur. If a device is having a, an issue possibly with a particular sensor, there are diagnostics that are actually certified by SIL, or Safety Integrity Level, or TUV, to make sure that you can detect that the device is having an issue and it can actually uh, send that information to a, a, a supervisory system or a safety system. So you get more reliable detection of faults and that equates to more uptime uh, and less maintenance on devices that's unscheduled. By having predictive, proactive maintenance-based um, algorithms in the device, you can actually predict device wear and tear. And by doing this, you get a feel for how much mileage have you put on this device? Has it been under stress conditions most of its lifetime? Should you consider scheduling it for a calibration? Or should you consider replacing the device completely to avoid unscheduled downtime in the future? These are all the benefits that we're seeing in recent trends in multivariable measurement and the resulting technology that enables them. Another trend that we see is the sophistication of the tools. There are now universal device type managers or DTMs that enhance process visibility and, and verification. If you look at the sample display that was actually a screen capture from a multivariable device, you can see multiple variables indicated as dials uh, on a gauge. So these are very familiar methods for displaying digital information that people are accustomed to. It also gives you very quick visibility about what is the relative difference between these different parameters. Are they moving in the same direction? Is there noise present on these parameters? These are all very useful in enhancing process visibility and, and getting a, a good warm feeling that everything's working as it should. By having all of the information in a screen like this, there are configuration templates that have default values and then can be used as examples based on a particular flow element that you might be using for your multi-process variable. These templates already have pre-configured values when you start the device up. And so you have a, a very good example of what the configuration would look like, and it simplifies the configuration process for the user. 
Another trend we see is that with the DTMs, um, the actual configuration of the device is, is not only made simpler, but it's more intuitive because as you change the configuration, you can see changes in, in the device needles. We're also seeing that for those users that use distributed control systems, the smart multivariable transmitter is really becoming an extension of your distributed control system interface. It's going to have the same look and feel as any other device in your control strategy. And that simplifies things for the user because you don't have to deal with different images uh, for different types of devices. You're always presenting the information in a consistent manner. Continuing on recent trends, there's improved measurement and control stability. One key contributor to control stability is a feature that's called failed safe feedback. A multivariable can be configured to fail safe. It keeps running at a preset value for compensating inputs, such as process temperature or static pressure. If you look at the temperature graph below, you can see that if the max or min temperature were to drift up to a high value, a pre-configured high value or pre-configured low value, the multivariable transmitter will automatically fall back that temperature variable to a safe value. So it stops using that sensor input and instead uses a configured constant. So during this time, the accuracy of your flow is not as good as it, it should be, but at least you don't go into a situation where your process is totally upset and you can actually address why your temperature uh, sensor may be drifting or may be higher than what's expected. The same type of concept would apply toward the static pressure sensor if your line pressure were to go above or below some type of limit. So with this type of feature, you don't let the temperature or static sensor fail your flow measurement. So I'm going to turn the conversation over now to Karthik, who is going to talk about the multivariable transmitter and what it does. Hey, thanks, Mark. Um, greetings again, everyone. So uh, let's let's put uh, in perspective uh, what is multivariable based on what just Tom described. Um, it simply measures all the primary variables. Um, one thing is you don't need that many instruments. That's the key, right? It, it measures all the primary process variables in your process. Uh, that's the line pressure, be it gauge or absolute, and then the differential pressure, uh, and then the process temperature, all in one. And then it calculates the bunch of parameters, um, which Tom explained how is it helpful in doing the dynamic compensation um, of. There are a lot of things which are going on in the pipeline uh, with your flow elements, with your pipes, um, because of thermal expansions, because of variation in pressure and temperature, uh, because of the flow provide, profiles, which changes the, uh, changes the Reynolds number. So it, it does calculate um, density, um, viscosity, uh, the beta ratio, uh, which is basically the, uh, the external diameter and the inner bore diameter of the flow element um, for, the, for the orifice plate uh, or whatever flow element you have. Uh, it, it, it calculates the expansion factor, which is um, primarily applicable for steam or a gas, and, and calculates the di discharge coefficient, uh, the approach velocity, and, and most importantly, Reynolds number uh, which influences the flow profile. It, it calculates all that, and, and that's where the, um, the microprocessor horsepower, which Mark, Mark talked about, um, is extremely relevant. So the device got to be extremely powerful, um, need to compute all this, and, and gives you the output at a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so that's where the horsepower matters, and, 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 and the key there is the powerful microprocessor
processes um, that reside in the device, right? Uh, okay, it measures the primary variables. It, it calculates the bunch of uh, parameters um, inside the device use, using the algorithms. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then it, it, it indicates as well as transmits um, the, all the primary variables and in addition to that, the calculated variable, which is either a MOS flow or a volume flow, right? Uh, being a smart device, um, uh, the user has the ability to strip out either of these variables uh, from the digital communication signal that's available as an output. If, if it's a heart, it has quite a lot of secondary variables, and, and customer um, has the freedom uh, to, to strip out the secondary variables and, and, and see them in the whole system or in the handheld device or use a DTM, uh, which, down, which, which Mark just explained, right? So essentially it, it measures the primary variables, calculates all the parameters that is helpful for either static or a dynamic compensation and, and transmits both the uh, primary variables as well as the calculated variable. So quite a lot of stuff uh, to do in a single device and, and that's why the uh, horsepower or the microprocessor capability that resides in the device is extremely important. So what possibilities it throws up? It throws up huge number of possibilities for a user. What are those? Number one, it, 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 because it's primarily based on a differential pressure measurement, then you are not constrained like other technologies uh, in terms of applications. You, you want to handle a liquid, uh, you want to handle gas, and, and you want to handle steam, both wet, wet and dry. Uh, it's a superheated steam or a saturated steam. So it has all the algorithms um, that is needed for, for calculating this, uh, these different applications. So the, the possibilities are absolutely limitless. So that's why when you look at um, the algorithms um, with respect to the applying multivariable technology, they are quite a lot. And, 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 and the device is extremely versatile in handling a wide variety of applications. And then just imagine putting this on top of the primary flow elements. So because of the horsepower, uh, because of the versatility of the instrument and, and the current technology trends, it really allows the technology gives space for programming all the algorithms of variety of flow elements because the flow element is one of the critical factor. We will talk about that in a minute when you, when you decide on an application, right? You, you can use a PETA tube, uh, you can use a different type of uh, orifice plate based on the application, and, 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 and typically if it's, a, if it's a high volume flow and if it's a steam, you, you go for a venturi, uh, you go for a flow nozzle sometimes, and, and if it's a slurry, you, you want to uh, manage the slurry and understand the slurry, and, and, and you also go for a wedge type of a uh, flow element. And, and there are some um, new age flow elements like V-cone, um, which come into picture um, if, if you have constraints in terms of uh, piping in the upstream and downstream, right? So which means that multiple flow elements uh, are uh, based on different type of engineering standards uh, for the calculation of flow, right? The major uh, and, and most popular engineering standards uh, are ISO, um, uh, International Standards Organization, uh, AGA for gas, uh, ASME has been around for quite some time, and, and GOST approvals, specifically relating to uh, certain geographical uh, standard requirements, meeting geographical standard requirements. So all these engineering standards um, can be supported in a multivariable technology. Again, it, it boils down to the kind of uh, horsepower uh, the device got to have uh, to make sure that it, it gives all possibilities for a user. Uh, because in different sections of the plant, in, in different um, areas of the plant, uh, depending on the application, uh, depending on the pipeline size, uh, you will be constrained in the selection of flow elements. And, and the device got to support that, and exactly that's what is being done, um, uh, this technology is doing. And, and that's precisely why the adoption of this technology is really growing at high single digit, uh, this of a slow single digit of single variable applications. Let's, uh, let's look at, um, you know, um, at a high level, uh, what are the direct and, and indirect benefits of this technology? Uh, the first thing is pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, the plants are becoming uh, more complex, right? You, the 
plants are becoming bigger, the number of measurements are going higher, and the resources that are needed to manage them are actually shrinking, which means uh, they're really a double-edged challenge for the user, right? So it, it makes a whole lot of sense to minimize the number of devices and maximize the number of measurements, and that's exactly what it does. Um, it reduces the number of devices, which means a lot of things, right? You minimize wiring, you, you minimize the control system footprint, to that an extent it, it limits the number of inputs and outputs uh, that are needed in the control hardware, in the control room. And, and most importantly, from the environmental perspective, um, which is becoming stringent by the day, you reduce the number of intrusions in the pipeline. Right? And, and if you employ this technology for level, and you reduce this uh, in the vessel as well, and, and which means that you are, you are eliminating leakage or you are indirectly benefiting from the lower maintenance time in the field, right? And, and because of the, um, uh, the compensation for flow, uh, which Tom talked about, both standard as well as dynamic, uh, it improves the accuracy of measurement. And it depends on your application. And, and if, if it is uh, related to control, then that's going to improve the quality of your product. And, in, and if it is related to a critical process, it's going to improve the yield of your process. Right, so accuracy either improves the yield or improves the quality um, and, and gives you a lot of benefit. And if you're, if you're deploying this in energy measurement, then you're saving dollars, right? So in, in every manufacturing industry, what is becoming important is the specific energy consumption uh, for the product. And by accurately monitoring the energy through higher accurate measurement, you are impacting the overall cost of energy in making the product, right? And, and another important thing is the installation cost. You're not going to install too many instruments. If, for example, you are, uh, you are deploying multivariable technology, at least you are reducing two instruments per flow measurement or a per multivariable measurement, which means all the associated hardware for mounting those two additional devices uh, mounting those two pipes, brackets, um, the impulse pipes which you run to, to install the devices, you're going to save and re really reduce on that. And because you're minimizing the number of instruments, it, it, it minimizes the maintenance. Uh, mind you, the lower the number of instruments, it automatically means that um, you got to calibrate, you got to check, um, you got to diagnose minimum number of instruments, so your amount of time that's spent on the field is going to come down, or the number of resources that you need for the same level of measurement is going to come down, right? So, so the multivariable technology clearly has lots of direct benefits and quite a lot of uh, indirect benefits. So let's see uh, what, what are the applications uh, for, for this uh, technology. Um, being a differential pressure-based uh, primary measurement, uh, literally multivariable applications cuts across all the industries. And, and interestingly, it finds application in the continuous process as well as uh, discrete industries, and you can see here. And as we go through this, you will find that there are applications which are common across all the industrial verticals, and, and that's precisely um, precisely energy measurement. So literally every industry uses um, fuel either as a feedstock, uh, for example, in case of a fertilizer industry, the feedstock itself could be natural gas, or in most cases, steam is used in, in, the, in the form of energy either for heating or cooling or even for drying, right? So energy measurement is one of the common denominator in which multivariable technology is used across all the industries, right? So you look at the um, glass industry, you know, the natural gas, if it's used as energy in a furnace, it's a big application. Same is the case with uh, oxygen. In, in case of a pulp and paper industry, uh, steam is used um, for captive power generation for running the pulp and paper plant and also for drying the paper in the paper machine, right? And, 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 and the recovery boilers and evaporator, evaporator systems are becoming extremely sophisticated. Um, the liquid which comes out of the digester, uh, which is used as a fuel and then generates steam and multivariable technology can be, can be used. 
And similarly, uh, to improve the concentration of the liquor, evaporators are used and steam is again consumed there. So, so in all these processes, it's important to have the mass-based measurement because finally, all these processes are calculated and run based on mass. You need so much ton of steam to dry so much ton of paper. You need so much ton of uh, evaporator to get the concentration from X percentage to Y percentage. It's all about mass. So wherever we have currently volume-based measurement, it makes a whole lot of sense to move that to mass-based measurement. So similarly, in the, in, the, um, in the hydrocarbon industry, the waste gas that flows on top of the vacuum distillation column is an excellent application for, uh, for multivariable technology. And so is the uh, oxygen and steam and acetylene gas in whole lot of um, chemical, chemical processes. And, and it's not all. Um, if you look at um, uh, the steel industry, uh, one of the um, very important application is, is in the area of blast furnace. And, and the coal blast, uh, which with the help of stalls uh, that gets heated, and, and that's used um, in the uh, blast furnace. And there is a precise process calculation that so much of coal blast is needed uh, for so much of ton of uh, steel that gets used in the blast furnace. So it makes a lot of sense instead of putting multiple measurement in the airline, one for flow, one for temperature, and one for pressure, makes a lot of sense to have a multivariable measurement there. And oxygen is used for enriching the coal blast, enriching the air, um, to, to make sure that the right content of uh, steel gets produced. That's a very good application for in, in, in the steel plant. And another discrete industry uh, which employs uh, multiple steam lines in the manufacturing process is the tire industry. In the tire curing press, there are quite a lot of steam lines and, and that can be deployed there. And you exactly know how much is the energy, how much is the specific energy consumption in that particular section of the plant. And, and, and thermal power generation, um, a great um, opportunity for deploying uh, the multiple, multivariable transmitter. And let's, let's talk a bit about the, the combustion air, right? So one of the important aspects of uh, running a boiler is making sure that it's running efficiently. At the same time, you minimize the environmental impact. And, and, and that's getting much more attention um, um, than in the previous years. And, and it's only going to get more stringent, right? And, and what's important there is the, the combustion control system component of the whole boiler control system. Uh, what does it mean? It means that you pump in the right amount of air, not something less and not excess air, to make sure that you burn the fuel completely without leaving uh, either, either generate, not either generating large amount of, um, you know, NOx, or at the same time, you don't pump in excess air and leave the heat in the, in the flue gas. So you've got to have a right amount of air, and that's where compensating uh, the air line with the right amount of flow measurement to make sure uh, that the proper combustion control happens is extremely important, not just for improving the boiler efficiency, but also keep a, keep a check on the uh, on the emissions. And, and, and same is the case with uh, other applications in boiler, uh, be it compensating for the feed water flow or the steam generation that comes up of the boiler. Uh, they are potential applications for, for deploying the um, multivariable technology. And, and it's the case with other, um, other verticals like petrochemical plants and, and fertilizer plants. Um, a steam is employed. Um, there are process air. While the consumption for uh, instrument air is not so much, uh, there are quite a lot of consumption for process air where uh, the multivariable transmitter can be employed. And there are applications where um, you want to meter the byproduct, and, and CO2 is one of the byproducts in the fertilizer manufacturing process because in, in case of a fertilizer, the fuel is a feed by itself. And, and, and when you use natural gas, which is what is the trend today, to make the fertilizer and, and that emits CO2 and you want to monitor them. As the load varies, the, the amount of CO2 that gets produced varies and, and, and multivariable technology is ideally suited for, um, for deploying the technology there and making an accurate uh, flow measurement. So if you see, 
there are multiple applications. Uh, one is for the purpose of uh, making sure that the quality of the process, the quality of the end product is right. Uh, another is for uh, for monitoring and optimizing the energy consumption, and another is really monitoring the specific energy consumption and 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 uh, the steam generation, um, and and all are, and 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 it's all emission related, not just process related. So a variety of possibilities, and and these are only a partial list of applications in these industries, and and the applications could be many more, and. Um, um, the 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 important thing is that we got to set the objectives very clearly um, before deploying this technology, so that you get the right level of outcome for all this. And and that's where I'm going to talk about uh, the challenges. The first and foremost is the selecting the application. Very very important and got to know the purpose or rather objective of using this technology. Is it for flow measurement? Um, is it to improve the accuracy? Uh, is it for uh, monitoring the energy? Or is it for some kind of a control loops? Or is it just, I just want to minimize the number of instruments and strip out as many process variables out there and I can do all my calculations in the host? So the multivariable need not be flow all the time. It could simply be deploying this technology to take out multiple number of, pro multiple number of process parameters. Right. One one good example could be a wellhead, wherein you just log out all the process variables and do whatever you want to do in the whole system. That's fine. Right. So defining the objective is extremely important. Then comes the um, location and installation. Right. Like with any other field instrument, you got to decide on 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 this location because you got to connect the uh, temperature sensor as well as the flow element uh, closer to the uh, transmitter and you got to decide on the location. So all the mounting and installation criteria that you will look for um, in, in any other single variable device is equally applicable for multivariable device, right? You got to know what the um, accessible level, um, got to have a right access for maintaining the device, um, got to place it uh, with the right level of HMI so you want to re see the reading or you want to do it in a remotely and then have a remote indicator. Um, you got to decide all that. And then, uh, based on the objective, you define the performance. If you're doing this for dynamic compensation, you, you got to understand the flow performance specification of the device. Um, if you are interested in just logging the uh, multiple variable out of the device, you got to know the performance characteristics of individual process parameters. Very, very important. And if this is for a specific um, a specific um, flow algorithm calculation, then you got to know whether such algorithms are supported in the device. So there are some of the common considerations. And then the flow element selection and sizing, a very important um, aspect because actually you begin here, right? The flow element se selection is influenced by several parameters, and, and um, at minimum, it includes the line size, uh, it includes your actual process fluid, and uh, what are the constituents on, on that. If it has suspended solids, there are specific flow elements even within orifice that you've got to consider. And uh, if you have constraints on upstream, downstream piping, then uh, that got to be taken care of because depending on the flow element, type of the flow element, uh, each of the flow elements supports certain level of upstream and downstream piping, very important, and you've got to consider that. And what is the allowable pressure loss which you are willing to sacrifice uh, for, for the particular flow element? And there are, um, there are um, opportunities, there are sizing applications which are available with the flow element supplier. Um, that they are very, very, uh, uh, they, they will come very handy in this uh, selection of, of, of the flow element. And then temperature sensor selection. Um, the multivariable technology, uh, like just Mark mentioned, it nowadays support universal sensors. And it, it, you can log a high temperature sensor using a thermocouple, and uh, it also supports the RTD. So based on the range of measurement, um, based on the speed of response that you need, um, because typically grounded thermocouples um, respond faster than ungrounded thermocouples or RTDs, and depending on the accuracy, uh, noise immunity, vibration, consider all that while selecting the temperature sensor. 
and do all this, and that automatically leads to the right performance, uh, right, right selection of the appropriate multivariable device. And then configuration and calibration. Uh, mind you, we are trying to configure at least three primary variables and one calculated variable. So the device got to be intuitive, need to have the right tools, and you got to calibrate for all the process variables. The device has to be calibrated for all the process, process variables. And that's why it's uh, very important to uh, spend time on proper selection of the multivariable device. And then the host system. The host system integration enables you to see uh, the right level of um, process variables, all the primary elements, primary variables, and the secondary variables um, in the host. Uh, that's why checking on the latest protocol standards, um, checking on the, on the host compatibility, uh, making sure that uh, you have the right tools uh, in the host system uh, to see all the devices, uh, all the device parameter is extremely important. And, and commissioning, uh, follow all the protocols that you would otherwise fo follow for any single, uh, single variable uh, device. Added to that, uh, you got to configure the device for your application, make sure that the uh, all the parameters are entered, not only for the primary and secondary variables, but also for for the uh, right level of information for the for the flow element. Here here is how uh, the DTM tools, which Mark talked about, is extremely handy um, because the 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 latest DTM tools um, um, allows you uh, to really guide you and then makes the configuration and commissioning extremely extremely simple. Lifecycle uh, management, one of the most important aspect in, in today's scenario. Um, everyone, every user now, they are aware that, that buying the device is, is, is just a part of the overall lifecycle cost for the user. The real cost involves running the device, installing the device, running the device, maintaining the device, and upgrading the device. Very, very important. The recent trends and technology allows, allows the upgrade of field instruments. So upgrades were primarily reserved for control systems several years back, but now even upgrade of the field devices are possible to an extent. So making sure um, that, uh, that the right level of spares, light, right level of upgrades are considered uh, during the selection of multivariable technology, because typically the unit, unit um, uh, deployment rate of this is much higher so the life cycle management is a very important consideration uh, for selecting the right multivariable uh, device. Um, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hand over uh, this back to Tom, and, and from here he will, he will talk about a typical example um, of the multivariable technology. Uh, Tom, back to you. Thank you, Karthik. Let's take a look at a very common example in the process industries where we control the exit temperature of a heat exchanger. In the traditional form, if we wanted to gather all the information here about the material entering the heat exchanger, what's being con controlled to maintain the exit temperature in the heat exchanger, for example, as previously explained, we'd have to measure the pressure, the temperature, the differential pressure, convert that in the traditional form into a volumetric flow rate, and we would only be controlling the volume of flow into the heat exchanger. As far as the steam control is concerned, we would be taking the exit temperature and doing what we call cascading temperature with flow. So we would take that output to the temperature indicator controller, set point the flow indicator controller, and control the steam flow into the heat exchanger. So take a look at all of the different devices. We've got 20 different devices. If I'm going to gather information about this entire control system here, I've got 20 devices that I have to install, maintain, worry about the life cycle, worry about wear and tear on the equipment. So, I mean, we've got a lot of stuff that we've got to keep track of, and if we could reduce some of it, it would be very beneficial. So in this control system, another thing that's uh, to be noticed about this control system is when upsets take place in the feed to the heat exchanger or in the steam system that's supplying 
the heating medium for the heat exchanger. We don't get any information about what's going on until we see a change at the exit side of this heat exchanger. So we can have upsets in the boiler system that's producing the steam. We can have units come online and go offline that upset the system. We can have changes in maybe another, another unit is supplying this material to the heat exchanger. We have upsets in that process. So the bottom line is, is we're still in feedback control to where we don't get any information about the exit temperature until it actually takes place. So moving on to the question at hand, what will it look like if I apply this multivariable technology to the process? Well, the simple answer to that is it depends on what you have in place, whether you have an analog system, a digital system, a programmable logic or automation controller, or you have a distributed control system. But the multivariable transmitter is the object of interest for today. So let's take a look at how we might solve that previous example in, in the traditional form using a programmable logic controller, an automation controller, or DCS system in order to do the same thing but get much better control and much better information about the process that we're trying to control. So in this case now, we install a multivariable transmitter with its temperature element on the flow and now we're going to take the conversions by measuring the pressures and the temperatures associated with the flowing medium into the heat exchanger. And now we're going to transmit a signal to my control algorithm that is in the form of mass. Same thing with the steam, that I'm going to do the same thing with the steam. I'm going to install the multivariable transmitter, do the calculation for mass flow rate, and input a signal into the algorithm, again, based on mass flow rate. So what is the advantage of this? If anything changes, and this is really important, if anything changes in the steam supply system or in the feed to the heat exchanger, now I don't have to wait until I get information about what's going on. In other words, in the previous example, I had to wait some amount of time until the outlet temperature told me that something had gone wrong in the system. So if pressures or temperatures affect what's happening to the feed going into the heat exchanger or something affects the steam supply into the heat exchanger, the multivariable transmitter will immediately take corrective action, recalculate mass flow rate, send it to the control algorithm, and I'll get a much faster response and better control as far as controlling the, either the feed rate into the heat exchanger or the steam flow going to the heat exchanger. So some of the things that I accomplished by changing to this type of control system is I reduced the number of I.O. points that previously I needed seven. Now all I need is five, so I've reduced, so I've got two freed up I.O. points in my PLC, PAC, or DCS system. I've reduced the number of devices required to install and maintain from 20 to nine. I've reduced the cost of installation materials I've lowered maintenance and spare parts cost, better measurement and control, better and more timely information about the process and measurement devices, and most importantly, when upsets take place in the feed or steam supply systems due to temperature and or pressure changes, corrective action takes place rapidly and more precisely. How fast that response is depends on your communications protocols and and the update time for the particular multivariable transmitter, but typically anywhere from a fraction of a second to a very few seconds before you get information to your control algorithm about something is upsetting the process or going to upset the process in the near future. Another example that I've had experience with is in, the, in what I call the recipe type or batch processing industry that time cycle management is an important concept and it's critical. The more time we save, the less time we spend on labor, materials, so forth and so on. So time cycle management is very important. And we had acid blends. One of the companies that I work for, we had acid blends that had to be made on a frequent basis because customers wanted particular, they wanted uh, blends with particular colors with different different compositions. So 
so we had to constantly be making acid blends. Before we applied the mass flow technology to this thing, we would have to add the materials to the tank, mix it, circulate it, sample it, take it to the quality control lab because we had no way of knowing anything that was going on other than we were adding X number of gallons of this, X number of gallons of that, and we were hoping that we got the formulation correct. Then whenever we decided to go to mass, we started uh, calculating the mass flow rates and adding the blend materials into the, into the tanks based on mass, and we reduced probably about 40% of the time required as far as mixing because what we would have to do is add something because it was added at different temperatures and pressures. We would have to make a blend, mix it, stir it, sample it, take it to the lab, wait for an analysis to be run. So then even later on, when online analyzers became popular, we put a gas chromatograph on the system to where now we were adding the materials into the blending tanks by mass. We were using an online analyzer to analyze the composition of it. So we reduced the, the time cycle for the, the blend management considerably. In summary, we've talked about traditional versus multivariable volumetric and mass flow measurements. We've discussed the fundamentals of multivariable measurement. We've talked about some of the major advantages. One transmitter replaces the cost associated with the installation and man man maintenance and management of three separate devices. Improves measurement, accuracy, control, stability, data, and process variability. Some of the challenges we discussed were the application, the location of the sensors, the performance required, the flow element selection, what we want to use to accomplish the task, temperature sensor, configuration, calibration, integration into our, in our, into our systems, commissioning, and life cycle management. And then we talked about a, a couple of solutions that we might, might apply. And I'll turn it over now to Michaela, and we'll take care of our question and answer period. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, before we head into our q and I'm going to go ahead and let everybody start entering questions into that Q&A chat box. Uh, while you're doing so, I'm going to remind everybody about ISA's POWID Symposium. Uh, it's June 27th through the 30th. Um, it's in Charlotte, North Carolina in the U.S. Um, registration is still open, so if you go to isa.org slash POWID2016, you can go ahead and learn a little bit more um, and register. Honeywell is a silver sponsor, so you can go ahead, visit their booth, and uh, check them out while you're there. So registration's open, um, and we'll head back to our Q&A portion. Uh, like I said, just enter your questions into the Q&A chat box. Um, if there's too many questions and we can't get to all of them within this webinar, then uh, you can contact the presenters directly uh, using their email address provided on this slide. Okay, we can go ahead and begin. Let's see the first one here. Um, it says, is multivariable also available for level measurement or is it only for flow measurement? Yeah, I can take that question, uh, Michaela. Um, yes, uh, multivariable uh, technology can be applied for flow as well as level measurement. Uh, the flow measurement applications are more popular um, because of the um, because of the complexity of the algorithms that reside in the device. Um, of course, by stripping out the multiple variables which are coming out of that, and algorithms can be executed in the whole system and uh, that can be used for level measurement. A classical application is um, measuring a boiler drum level um, using the whole system algorithm for the, uh, for the shrinkage of level in the boiler drum by compensating for the variations in, in, in pressure um, as well as the uh, differential pressure. Yes, it's possible. Um, to do level measurement, compensated level measurement in, with multivariable technology. Great, thank you. All right, next question. Are multivariable transmitters necessarily related to multivariable control algorithms, uh, MIMO, 
or uh, it makes sense to use those transmitters on SISO systems as well, linking some inputs from transmitters to some outputs of SISO controllers. I can take that question, Michaela. Okay. So multivariable transmitters and the way that we have framed them in this presentation, they're actually taking a number of single inputs and combining them into the desired output, which is either volume or, or mass flow. So in a uh, single input, uh, single output system, you, as was explained in Tom's um, example of the, con the boiler, the controller, there are multiple single inputs that are going to single loops, okay, and those single loops are being processed externally by uh, a distributed control system and, and doing that at a much slower rate, okay, than what's possible in a multivariable trans transmitter where you're combining all of those inputs right into the equations in closer to real time and, and getting better, faster results. So there is um, application for using all of those inputs inside the multivariable transmitter in a, in a, uh, a multiple input, multiple output or MIMO system as you're suggesting. So the fact that all of those single inputs are measured and calculated inside the smart multivariable transmitter, they are still available as individual measurements and they could be used in parallel by a multivariable control algorithm that's operating at a higher level in the control structure. Okay, great, thank you. Our also, next also Michaela, okay. go ahead. Also, also, did I hear in the question something about safety instrument and systems? Um, look, back, look back in there and see if you see SIS in there. I thought I heard that, but maybe I didn't. I, I'm I seeing SISO, which is single input, single output control. Oh, okay. Really okay. In the context okay. of the question I, versus I multiple input. I wanted to comment on if, if you're using multivariable transmitters to do anything associated with SIL 1 through SIL 4 certification, one of the basic rules of thumb is, is that if you use the multivariable transmitter to measure your control parameter, then you must use exactly the same thing in your safety instrumented system. In other words, you have to compare apples with apples, bananas with bananas. You can't have one type of measurement device and being backed up by a completely different type of device. So. All right, great, thank you. Um, our next question is, uh, for a mathematical model of any process with many kinds of variables ident uh, identified and measured or indirect calculated more than four variables, what is the best strategy to analyze the different correlations and connections on this variable? Yeah, I can take that question, right? So the, the multivariable transmitter technology is trying to trying to uh, measure multiple parameters, right? And 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 it uses that in the algorithms that resides in the device. If the correlations and if um, if the and, and the connections got to be studied, uh, that's typically done in some kind of a process analytical software in the host. How a multivariable device might aid in that process is by sending out, by configuring the device for all the secondary variables. So logging all the parameters for the process analyzing software easier, and that's typically done in a host system. In terms of technology with multiple variable, like Mark talked about, it's possible to have some kind of a long-term trending in the device. Um, you can trend, you can, the technology currently is available to locally trend different variables on a longer time frame as long as 24 hours. And, 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 and somebody wants to troubleshoot the process, 
locally, right at the instrument level, we'll be able to see how the multiple parameters are varying over a period of time. They also can be logged in, in the DTM, and, and the DTM, you have a facility to configure the gauges for multiple variables, and um, a, a manual correlation and connection can be, can be seen in the host. If something beyond that got to be done, then typically it is done with, with, with some kind of a process analytical software that simply takes out the trending data and then does all the correlation algorithms. It's, it's possible, but it's typically an, uh, a standalone analytical software that does the job. But the most important point here is that having decided to do some kind of correlation and connection, it's, it's still possible to use the multivariable technology because primarily it gives you the data, uh, which is the backbone of any, any uh, studying any correlations and connections. All right, great, thank you. Um, our next question is, uh, what devices are in the market that fulfill these duties? And I know we want to stay vendor neutral here, um, but our presenters can uh, maybe suggest things that they've used in the past or currently use and um, kind of open it up from there. Yeah, so this is not a very uncommon technology. The technology has been, um, has been around uh, for quite some time now, and, and all the global manufacturers uh, do have such uh, technologies. Uh, of course, there are, there are a lot of difference in the flavors and the benefits <laughs> and, and based on the individual, um, you know, individual devices, but, but pretty much these are common, and quite a lot of um, global suppliers are available for, for such technology. I might add to that that whenever you're evaluating a manufacturer's piece of equipment for this multivariable application, pay close attention to the specifications for the pressure sensor and the temperature sensor because that's, that's the backbone of the thing working properly. So high quality temperature sensor and a high quality pressure sensor is absolutely essential if it's going to improve your position. All right, next question. Uh, do you agree that the overall maintenance cost for this device is is more as the failure of any single sensor of a multivariable transmitter will force us to replace the whole transmitter being more costly? I think I can take that question, uh, Michaela. So a we, we, couple of things we talked about in the webinar. Um, uh, Mark talked about uh, the fail-safe um, uh, feature of the device, which is one of the recent trends. So in first place, um, uh, because we are putting too many measurements in the same basket, and, and that's why we, uh, we have come, that's why uh, the technology is now allowing, um, allowing us to have such fail-safe features. Um, that is, any failure of any of the compensating variables, don't let the measurement down and, and still, uh, still you get that measurement. So in first place, that is taken care by the technology itself. Okay, going beyond, yes, the, the device is uh, obviously expensive than a single input, single variable device. Uh, the, the multivariable, not just multivariable technology, overall, the field instrument technology is moving towards uh, some kind of a modular architecture. Um, modular hardware and upgradable firmware are the routes for the future, and, and that's what Mark talked about. He talked about the microprocessor technology. And, 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 and the devices which are, um, the, the technology which is available currently is in helping the customer um, to, to rip and replace as a full replacement because it's modular, um, the technology nowadays allows you to replace a particular field module with the full unit, uh, thereby um, allowing you to reduce the overall life cycle cost. And that's why we talked about the life cycle management. So number one, in short, number one, um, you are not in a single mode failure just because you are uh, measuring multiple parameters in a single device uh, because of the fail-safe measurement technology that's adopted in this multivariable technology. And number two, if the device is modular, then that allows you to still own the device and replace only that particular module with a full unit replacement, thereby reducing your overall life cycle cost. 
I, I would also add to that that with a, the multivariable device, as, as Tom showed us in the heat exchanger control example, you have fewer process intrusions. And when you look at maintenance costs, that's where a lot of the maintenance goes. It's maintaining those intrusions, making sure that they don't leak, checking them for corrosion, making sure that the integrity is good, making sure that your, your primary elements aren't fouling or wearing out. So just the fact that you have fewer process intrusions, that is a, a big savings in, in maintenance um, over using individual devices that would re re require their own drilling or installations. On the other side, and, 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 and Karthik was, was, was alluding to this, if you look at the electronics, all of the manufacturers are building to SIL um, safety integrity levels. So what we're actually doing is calculating MTBFs and making sure that, that our delivered products actually are delivering those mean times between failures. So even though the device is more complicated, okay, internally, and that's a good point, that is not allowed to affect its safety integrity level score. It still has to meet a certain level independent of the complexity of the device, which means that the mean time between failures isn't any different for that one transmitter versus several. Good point. Okay, next. Um, our next question, um, how does MTTF uh, for a multivariable compare to MTTF of single measurement transmitters? So I kind of just touched on that. And uh, the, the single, the, the mean time to failure of any SIL related transmitter. So I think it's, it's important to understand SIL safety integrity level. And when you're purchasing a device, make sure that the, that the device is SIL approved. And also look in the details of the SIL manual to see what is the maintenance cycle to maintain those mean time to failures. Um, but the idea is that you only have one mean time to failure of one device when you use the multivariable approach. If you, have a sep if you have two separate pressure transmitters or three separate pressure transmitters and two different temperature transmitters, you're actually looking at the, the mean time to failure is, is, is probably best calculated as a, an RSS calculation of the, of the mean time to failures of all of those devices, which is going to be much lower than that of the mean time to failure of a single device. So, Again, it, it points in the direction that the single device, if it's built to a SIL standard, is going to be more reliable than multiple devices because there are fewer points of failure. There are thousands of less parts internally in the circuitry, hundreds and hundreds fewer connections in, in the circuitry. And as far as the mechanics and the corrosions of the sensors, there's fewer sensors involved. All right, uh, moving right along. Um, how to cross-check SMV flow by any manual calculation? I'd like to take that one just briefly. How fast can you punch the numbers? Basically, what's happening in, a, in the variable equations, there are thousands, if not tens of, tens of thousands of calculations being done each second. So, it's, I understand the desire to cross-check that flow by manual calculation, but I think it's more than calculation. Uh, you would actually have to do a flow sample and, and actually divert the flow into a, a way scale or some other type of alternative flow method or use an, another inline flow meter that is probably much more expensive than the smart multivariable device itself because you want to verify its accuracy. So therefore, its accuracy would have to be at least three times better. Uh, Tom, you may have, you may have you know, more things that you may want to add in that area based on your yeah. experience in industry. 
Yeah, typically, typically the manufacturers of most flow systems now are using what we call the gravimetric method for proving their meters, like all the manufacturers of mass flow meters and everything. So you can even improve an office meter type application with the multivariable transmitter. You can convert it to mass flow, but then you can also prove it with a a, a meter of higher accuracy or one of gravimetric. The gravimetric is is the best like Mark was saying, flowing into a tank that's already set up with load cells and everything and certified by the state that you're operating in that you can you can tweak the calculations or whatever you want to do. So you can come up with a very accurate measurement if you go the, the gravimetric route. I would, I would also add that the calculation themselves are actually checked by the firmware engineers to various standards to make sure that if you provide certain inputs to these equations that are calculating thousands of times, okay, um, to make sure that, that when you're actually developing that firmware, that the outputs of those equations match the standards. So that's actually done at a, at a development level uh, by the, the field instrument designers. Um, so that's done before the, the product is, is ever put into operation in the field. But so there's two ways you could take that question. Like how do we know that there are no bugs in the flow equation software? So I just addressed that. And then the other one is that if you actually want to check the flow of the overall device, you need a, an independent flow measurement uh, or mass measurement that is that's traceable to a, a National Bureau of Standards, as is our, pro, you know, our, the actual products that you're installing. They have NBS traceability. Um, and, then, and then verifying that with a, a third-party uh, third instrument that's more accurate. Yeah, I didn't, even, I didn't even expand on the control concept when I was given the uh, heat exchanger example. But for instance, we have just basic feedback control that we can possibly control a heat exchanger with. If that doesn't work out well for us, we can go to cascade control. And then the extreme move is if we can't control it with that, like in some cases in the plastics industry, losing a heat to a heat exchanger is not a good thing. So we can go to feed forward control. But one of the things that the, the multivariable transmitter does is it gives me information about what's taking place now. That's important, what's going on right now sending a corrected signal and in many cases in a fraction of a second to the control algorithm to where I may be even I may be allowed to just use this cascade control system with multivariable transmitters instead of having to go to the elaborate uh, engineering involved with uh, feed forward control. So that's an advantage also. And, and finally, um, for what it is worth, the, the DTM technology that Mark explained has a facility for simulation. So a, a user has a facility to input, simulate the conditions, and then check the flaw. Um, doesn't really uh, compensate for the manual calculation, um, but gives you a feel of what's, what's happening at different values. All right, great, thank you. Uh, next question, um, is it possible that a multivariable flow transmitter can deal with higher Reynolds number, which may result due to uh, wrong installation, for example, an orifice very close to an elbow? Mm, you so, might, you might. Um, I would, I would have to, I would have to look at that either, either graphically or that. But if you get too close to an elbow, now elbow taps, we do those at 45 degree angles on the inside and outside of the elbow. So if you get where orifice is concerned or anything, if you get any pre disturbance in the flowing system before you actually uh, approach the elbow or the orifice, that that's not good. So I. So I would and, and, I would not I would not advise putting go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Go ahead. That I I would not advise one one rule of thumb that I follow when it comes to differential pressure flow measurements is I I really don't pay a lot of attention to 
so many pipe diameters upstream and downstream, here's a good rule. Get it as straight a run of pipe as you can. <laughs> I mean, that if you go through elbows or whatever, you're going to add disturbance in there, and that's going to that's going to confound your calculation. So I would have to look at the exact locations for all the devices that are intrusive into the piping system before I could say, you know, I thought that would be an okay installation or not. Yeah, I, I think following the installation instructions is are, are critical. Um, in a situation like this, I would also expect that that individual variable to have more noise in it than what it should. And that's going to result, since the you have more horsepower under the hood, you actually can see that noise, okay, in your in your flow rate. So um, that's something that uh, could be difficult to diagnose because if it was installed improperly in the first place, you might be thinking that the flow noise that you're seeing is just normal. Whereas if you had installed it according to the manufacturer's recommendations, um, you would see that the noise wasn't present. So I think it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, I wouldn't use a multivariable transmitter as a way to break the, the rule, basically, on how to handle the Reynolds number. I agree. Okay, <clears throat> next question. Uh, the plants that use advanced process control, should they expect to see better results if using multivariable transmitters in the field? Yeah, I think I can take that question. Yes, absolutely. Um, the, the advanced process control um, plays a major role on top of the basic process control. Uh, the better your measurement is, the better the basic control is. And um, if, if there are multiple variables um, which are part of the advanced process control, the variables keep, the, 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 depending on the criticality of the variables, the, either the advanced process control works in the optimal condition or a suboptimal condition or doesn't work if some of the critical variables fail because even basic controls will fail. So if we have an advanced process control loop based on one of those critical loops, and if that particular loop is a flow control loop or a level control loop with a higher level of desired accuracy, then the outcome of the advanced control automatically becomes better, and it makes absolute sense to improve on the accuracy of those critical measurement parameters on which the advanced process control is implemented. All right, moving right along. Uh, do you know about software tools to analyze the variations and correlations in groups of variables associated in any kind of industrial process? Yeah, I can take this question. Um, there are um, a number of, of statistical process control analysis tools, and I would not, I would not endorse or, or uh, say anything against any of the tools that are out there. Um, I think that there's just a general category of tools under what I would call design of experiments, which is, has been recognized um, as a Six Sigma best practice for, for decades. And this provides multivariate, multivariate analysis where you can look at multiple inputs and multiple outputs simultaneously and use statistical methods such as best fits regression or designs of experiments uh, where you would be able to look at uh, or actually induce small variations in the process to try and understand the main effects of, of what's going on. The reason why you want to use multivariate, multivariate analysis is because a lot of control engineers, well, not so much control engineers, but engineers in general, they, they want to vary one factor at a time to see what happens to an output. In a multivariate situation, that exact, is exactly the opposite thing that you want to do 
because if you're controlling or changing one factor at a time and looking at only one output at a time, you're missing any cross-product interactions between those inputs that could be affecting an output. The other reason you don't want to do one factor at a time is because if you can look at, you're only going to find one relationship and that relationship is assuming all of the other factors and outputs are constant. So that's, that's the reason for having cascaded loops and control schemes. But if you want to look at multiple, um, if you can look at multiple inputs and multiple outputs simultaneously and see how they're interacting, and that's what these multivariate tools do, then you're in a much better position to see which inputs have the most impact on the outputs and how can you control them better. In addition, by using a statistical multivariate tool, you can actually determine how much better your process will be at a level of confidence based on statistical sampling methods. So I, I would suggest um, a, a product uh, that I have used is, is, is Minitab. It's used by our organization. It's a statistical process tool, but there are, there are similar things that you could do in MATLAB, and, and I'm sure there are dozens of other tools that um, are very capable of, of doing these types of calculations. But it is, it's not the type of, of tool that you're going to load on your PC and become proficient at it in an hour. It, it does take some time. Okay, uh, we just have a few minutes here, so we'll only be able to take a couple more questions. Um, let's see here. Are these tools specialized in the kind of process? What kind of pre-requirements are necessary to use that tools? The, um, the tools that I had mentioned, um, they, you know, as far as being specialized in a kind of process, no, because the tool is the tool doesn't know what it's doesn't know anything about the process. It's just looking for relationships between variables. So I think that the tools in general are are analyzing relationships that are statistically significant between inputs and outputs. So the types of pre-requirements that would be necessary to use these tools is that first, you need to be able to introduce some small bumps in the inputs manually to, to create excursions or bumps in the outputs because in order to adjust or to make an assessment of sensitivity, you need to see, you know, you have to change something to see rates of change. So a pre-requirement is that the process um, you know, it should be offline and you may have to expect to produce out of spec performance. <clears throat> An exception to that is some suppliers um, have auto tuning processes where the auto tuning processes will generate these small bumps based on history and make sure that those bumps are not going to create too large a disturbance, but still be able to analyze how well is your control strategy working, or is there a sensitivity that's changed since the last time you've made an assessment? So that's a, a, it's, a, it's, a it's a very good question, but it's a, a pretty wide scope for the answer. All right, uh, we'll just take two more questions here. Uh, do you think that it is a good practice to leave single devices as a backup in case uh, that the multivariable meter fails, or will this affect my control? I think I can take that question. So, um, like we talked about, um, the the multivariable technology um, currently, because of the cost over which Mark talked about, has the provision uh, to 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 give you the consistent measurement in case of. Um, failure of one of the compensation parameters. It, it gets you the facility to enter some kind of a default value so all doesn't go bad and something goes up. So that, that's pretty much taken care. Um, do we need a backup? Uh, that absolutely depends on what kind of application is, right? If, if the application is for some of the critical controls, 
and um, and and uh, you want to have that as a you want to have for example one of the primary measurements as an additional additional measurement that's always possible it doesn't affect your control because the way the backup is up, it is implemented in the whole system uh, the failure of uh, the one device seamlessly transfer uh, to take the measurement from another device but as long as the measurement is not in a critical control or a control parameter uh, we wouldn't really recommend a backup because you number one you have the you have the inherent fail safe feature which is available uh, that's number one and number one number two uh, because of the hardware architecture um, the faults can be reasonably uh, at a reasonable time interval can be fixed because you, you we are talking about a modular hardware and upgradable or fixable firmware and it's not that you 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 are all the time going to look for some kind of a field returns or anything the technology today allows you to uh, fix the issues quite faster and it, it purely depends on the application so if it's not a critical control um, then then the backup may not be necessary all right last question here and then we'll wrap up uh, how realistic is it to retrofit existing multi-instruments with a multi-variable? Would it only be a factor of proximity? Yeah, I can take that question. Um, the biggest advantage of the multi-variable technology is that it, it simply builds on the conventional differential pressure measurement uh, based on the primary flow elements and the traditional DP technology, which means that um, replacing a conventional single input device, uh, which follow the ISO standard in terms of the center to center distance on connections, uh, it's it absolutely a one to one replacement of most of the single single input devices. So it doesn't call for any changes in terms of piping, uh, in terms of alignment. The the topography of the multivariable device is is similar to the footprint and the mechanical front footprint of the multivariable device is similar to that of a single input device. So the mo not a not a lot of uh, field work is needed, and it all depends. It it's equivalent to replacing any other device with a new device during the regular maintenance, replacement, and operation process. Well, uh, however, what is more important is to check on the uh, the reliability or the or the condition of the flow element if the replacement is done with a view to improve the accuracy then the condition of the flow element got to be evaluated as long as the flow element fits the purpose and mechanically without any erosion it is in a good shape that could be used another aspect of that is the condition of the temperature sensor as as tom mentioned uh, the the temperature measurement accuracy plays a very critical a very very critical role in determining the overall flow accuracy because that's one of the key parameter for the multivariable technology and once we check the health and condition of the flow element and the and the temperature sensor that's out there there may not be any need uh, to replace them and and with respect to wiring it all stays the same because whether it's a conventional single input device or a multivariable device it's going to use the same two wire technology so there won't be much of much of uh, retrofitting that is needed and it's pretty much possible um, to retrofit the existing setup um, by checking the flow element health and the temperature sensor health with, with the multivariable device Great, thank you all. Uh, this concludes our Q&A portion. If we were unable to get to your question, uh, like I said, you can reach out to the presenters directly using their email address um, as listed here on this slide, and I'll also be sending you their contact information um, sometime this week in a follow-up email. Um, like I said earlier, remember there's Powered Symposium that's coming up in June. Uh, registration is open, so please take a look at it and register. And if you missed any portion of this webinar, we did record it, um, so I'll be sending you a link to the recording hopefully sometime this week, uh, so you can take a, back, a look back at it. You can also share it with your colleagues, um, so I'll be sending that shortly. 
And once this webinar closes, please take the survey that's going to pop up in your browser. It's a fairly short survey. We just want to know how your experience was in today's webinar. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you in one of our future webinars.